In October of 1892, Ida Wells took the stage in New York City's Lyric Hall. She came to describe the horrors that were unfolding in her hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. She was in New York because she was in exile. Earlier that year, the leading businessmen of Memphis had assembled at the Cotton Exchange Building. They were angry over a story that Ida Wells had printed in her newspaper, The Free Speech. The men began to plot lynchings, and their main target was Wells. She escaped that murder, and she lived to tell the world what was happening down south. The cause of all this commotion was the following editorial published in the Free Speech, May 21st, 1892, the Saturday previous. Eight Negroes lynched since last issue of the Free Speech at one Little Rock, Arkansas. Last Saturday morning where the citizens broke into the penitentiary and got their man. Three near Anniston, Alabama, one near New Orleans, and three at Clarksville, Georgia. The last three for killing a white man, and the five on the same old racket. The new alarm about raping white women. The same program of hanging, then shooting bullets into the lifeless bodies was carried out to the letter. Nobody in this section of the country believes the old threadbare lie that Negro men rape white women. If Southern white men are not careful, they will overreach themselves and public sentiment will have a reaction. A conclusion will then be reached which will be very damaging to the moral reputation of their women. The editorial in question was prompted by the many inhuman and fiendish lynchings of Afro-Americans which have recently taken place and was meant as a warning. Eight lynched in one week and five of them charged with rape. The thinking public will not easily believe freedom and education more brutalizing than slavery. And the world knows that the crime of rape was unknown during the four years of civil war, when the white women of the South were at the mercy of the race which is all at once charged with being a bestial one. Since my business has been destroyed and I am in exile from home because of that editorial, the issue has been forced, and as the writer of it, I feel that the race and the public generally should have a statement of the facts as they exist. They will serve at the same time as a defense for the Afro-American Simpson, Samsons who suffer themselves to be betrayed by white Delilahs. The whites of Montgomery, Alabama knew J.C. Duke sounded the keynote of the situation which they would gladly hide from the world. When he said in his paper, the Herald five years ago, why is it that white women attract Negro men now more than in former days? There was a time when such a thing was unheard of. There is a secret to this thing, and we greatly suspect it is the growing appreciation of white Juliets for colored Romeos. Mr. Duke, like the free speech proprietors, was forced to leave the city for reflecting on the honor of white women and his paper suppressed. But the truth remains that Afro-American men do not always rape white women without their consent. Mr. Duke, before leaving Montgomery, signed a card disclaiming any intention of slandering Southern white women. The editor of the free speech has no disclaimer to enter, but asserts instead that there are many white women in the South who would marry colored men if such an act would not place them at once beyond the pale of society and within the clutches of the law. The miscegenation laws of the South only operate against the legitimate union of races. They leave the white man free to seduce all the colored girls he can but it is death to the colored man who yields to the force and advances of a similar attraction in white women. White men lynch the offending Afro-American, not because he is a despoiler of virtue, but because 
he succumbs to the smiles of white women. That was Camille Sims reading from Ida Wells' pamphlet, Southern Horrors. And hello, I am Kai Wright. I'm the host of United States of Anxiety. We are in our third season, and we're focused this season on the relationship between gender and power in American politics. And I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit later in the show, but for now, I, I really want to keep you focused on Ida Wells because there is no way to talk about gender and power in America without first talking about Ida and the things that she brought to the fore. And you know, when we first started this season, uh, I, I, I knew that to be true. I thought we were gonna have to tell a story about Ida, but I, I will have to say that I was embarrassed to learn how little I actually knew a little of her story that, that I actually knew. And you know, not to toot my own horn, but that's saying something, because I have spent most of my adult life <laughs> thinking about and studying and reading on black people and black politics, and yet she, and that is an important part of it, she remained in my blind spot. And so and then I read a book, uh, and it is a book called Ida, A Sword Among Lions, it is an exhaustive, compelling, must read of a book about this woman's life and why it is so important. And I am thrilled that tonight I can introduce you to her, to the author of that book. Her name is Paula J. Giddings. She is the professor emeritus, sorry, a professor emerita of African studies at Smith College. And she is Ida Wells's biographer. Paula? Please join us. Hello, Kai. And hello. Thank you, you for. Doing? Hello, everyone. So I, I, um, I, I as I, I told you when I, when, when we first met, that I was. Uh, uh, deeply ashamed that I had not read your book before before I made we started working on this podcast and it is uh, uh, it is it is it is really that. truly a must thank read. You, thank you. Don't be ashamed. No. <laughs> we all, we live and learn. We yeah, live and yeah, learn. That's go. right. You are an educator. So uh, maybe I learned a lot too. By the way, just doing the research on her, of course. Right. Yes, because none of us know uh, enough about Ida Wells. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, maybe help us first. Help <laughs> us understand. Let's start with what we've just heard the, the, uh, and help put this in some context. We've collapsed things a little bit in the presentation uh, of Camille's read. She read from Southern Horrors. This, was, this pamphlet was really the, the sort of the final act in a series of things that occurred in 1892 mm -hmm. that launched Ida into her anti-lynching crusade. Give us a little of the backstory. What, what, what was Ida reacting to? What, what was the event? Uh, in March of 1892, uh, a good friend of Ida's, more than a good friend, she was actually the godmother of his child, by a man by the name of Thomas Moss, a sterling citizen in Memphis, a kind of symbol of, a, of, the, of, of the promises of the New South, a man who worked all of his life, a man who was the president of a grocery <coughs> in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and the grocery was a co-op, another sort of symbolic, was a co-op owned, co -owned by uh, about 20 black citizens. Uh, and, but this co-op, unfortunately, this grocery store uh, competed with a white-owned store. And in the numbers, in the series of incidents, uh, the white proprietor really foisted a, 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 a uh, 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 was responsible for, um, I'll have to shorten the story, <laughs> was responsible for the police coming and arresting Thomas Moss, supposedly for, uh, uh, for starting a riot in this area of Memphis, Tennessee, where the store was. Uh, he was placed in jail uh, and later was taken out uh, by masked men, along with two others, uh, and lynched, horribly, tortured. Uh, and 
it made Ida Wells really realize that there was already suspicions about this lynching business that was going on. Uh, as was read, this, these lynchings were increasing in this time, it was kind of mysterious. Some people, we don't realize that it's not until 1886 that more blacks are lynched than whites. Uh, lynching is, a, is as American as apple pie, it starts in the Revolutionary War period. <clears throat> And people are wondering, what is going on? They know this rape business can't be right. And what Wells realizes with the lynching of Moss is that it's not about rape at all, really. It's about the competition, an economic competition uh, of blacks and whites and the power that blacks were gaining in this period of time. You know, we're thinking about an election. Uh, in Memphis, Tennessee in 1880, 90% of eligible black voters voted, put in a Republican governor, put in a number of black legislators uh, who were very adamant about civil rights. Uh, so this power had to be stopped. And that's, I mean, one of the important things, and there's so many things just packed into what you've already said, but that one of the important things about that time, we don't think about it. Black, Ida is in the first generation of, peop, of black people to grow up free in the South. That's right. And they come out of the gates swinging. That's right. I mean, they, right. they are succeeding by every measure. By, by every measure. I always I like to tell my students, I said, you know, ours is not, blacks, our history is not a history of never having. It's a history of things being taken away all the time. And what was happening, what was happening in the black community was extraordinary. I mean, illiteracy is almost cut in half in this period of time because blacks, one person uh, described the number of blacks getting educated after, the, after emancipation was like, it was like a whole race trying to go to school. I mean, Ida's mother went to school with her and the, and the, and the, and, and the children. Uh, there were blacks in, in uh, political positions because the Republicans were in. So there were, it was the first black, you know, uh, uh, blacks graduating from, from Harvard, uh, Phi Beta Kappas from Harvard, people in all kinds of positions that were happening. So this, this was very alarming right. of what was happening with, um, uh, in terms of the quick progress of uh, African Americans in this period of time. And for Ida herself, she was, by the time of this lynching, she was quite a success herself. She had become the only black woman uh, to be editor-in-chief and co-owner of a newspaper That's in the right. country. That's right. Uh, and, which was a, a big deal. The black press was a very big deal at the time. So she was part of this black elite. This is, this is the golden age of the black press. Uh, there are over 200 newspapers being published every week, many of them quite good. Women were a part, not as editors. Uh, you're right that Ida was, one of the, was the only editor and co-owner but, there were, but black women were very much a part of the press at this period of time. The, the press was very progressive. It was about in, in, the, uh, in the traditional sense of the word progressive. Uh, and they knew that black women had to be a part of the story, of this progress of blacks, just one generation from slavery. Uh, so, so yes, so, uh, so, the, so the news, and, and this also, of course, is a reflection of the, of the less illiteracy, because now blacks, there are enough black papers could be published because they had a black market. Right. Uh, so it was quite extraordinary. So she was extraordinary. As you, some of you, I'm sure, you, you know the story that uh, uh, after a particular uh, convention of newspaper uh, editors, two uh, men come up to Ida and ask her to, to please uh, write for their newspaper called the Memphis uh, Free Speech and Headlight at that time. And I just said, well, I will only if I become a co-owner. <laughs> yes, girl. So, <laughs> yes, indeed. She did the same thing, by the way, in New York uh, with, that, uh, with the New York Age. She said, I'm, I'll sell you my subscription list, but I've got to be part, part of this. You know. So she was also, you know, she was quite extraordinary. She believed in economic on. empowerment. She, she, cer she, cer she, she certainly did. So then, but also at this time, what I think is interesting in her story that you really lean into in the book is that, so in this period, she's successful, the community is successful, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an edge to it for her, that there's this politic uh, of, of proving how civilized that you could be, uh, what we now think of as respectability politics. And she 
is having a really hard time. Even before lunch, <clears throat> she's having a really hard time yes. living that life. Yes, yes. To help us because understand where she's women, at. Sometimes we, uh, we, we forget that black people are emancipated during the Victorian period. So it's not just race. It's all that gender confusion going on. Uh, and, uh, and the idea before Ida Wells, and Ida Wells is very important to this, but the idea before her campaign is that we have to live a certain way, in a respectable way, be good American citizens. If we do the right thing, if we, and uh, wealth was very important, accumulation of wealth was very important in this period of time. Of course, education, certain kinds of behavior, middle class bourgeois behavior, that with this, we will become first class citizens. It's just inevitable. Remember, these people are very optimistic. They, after all, they've been emancipated. So they thought this was the path. Uh, respectability was the path. But of course, if you're too respectable, you're not going to protest. If you're too respectable, you're not going to deal with the working and the laboring classes of African Americans, who many elites were ashamed of in this period of time because they didn't live up to this standard. She herself is a little, you know, I, Ida Wells, but what happens with this lynching with, with Thomas Moss, Ida Wells is a Victorian herself uh, and starts off as a very conservative figure. It's got a bit of a Bill Cosby to her going there. And I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go that far, Kai. <laughs> I stand very <laughs> no, well correct. No, yes, <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but what she, does, what she does realize is that Respectability is okay in and of itself, but it's not an agent of change. It's not going to get us where we want to go. And so she's the, really the first to be able to articulate that uh, through her campaign. And so let's talk about some of the things that she then, because she, as you put it, she starts to follow the logic of lynching, uh, and that leads her to these ideas. Um, and you know, one of the things she starts talking about is sex. We heard that from the from 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 the reading. Uh, put this in context of the time. I mean, she's not just this isn't just a purian interest in who's sleeping with who. Uh, help us understand why this was such an important thing for her to say, and that no one, to be clear, nobody had said those kind of words in public no, ever. No, no one used the word rape. You know, the the term was outraged. Right? We were outraged, right? We're really talking about the outrage of men, really, that their women were raped. Um, but yes, um, this is a period of, uh, you know, I, I, I like it. I think of uh, Ida Wells as, as really the beginning of a kind of a modern identity of African American people moving beyond the Victorian period. <clears throat> when, uh, when authenticity replaces sincerity. And where you have to, where she decides to be direct and uses, if you read, if you all know 19th century literature, black or white, it's very flowery and Victorian. Ida Wells is, does not write that way. It's very direct, she says early on. <clears throat> I, uh, I never use two syllables when one will do. <laughs> and she's very, very clear. She wants no this. one confused. No one confused. And she's the one that really brings sex into the political realm, out of the bedroom, out of these false uh, ideas around, uh, uh, about the primitivity of black people, which makes them hypersexual. That was, of course, underneath the idea of black men raping white women. Uh, and she brings us out in the public, uh, in, in a public way, which is very, very controversial among black people uh, as well. And Particularly, it began a, a lifelong battle that she had with liberal white women, with white feminists. Yes. Uh, why, why? Why is why? And, and not just white feminists, black feminists too. Uh, th this is also a period when um, white women, particularly though, is trying to get into the public sphere. One of the pressures, one of the tensions that's going on is that white women, uh, after and particularly southern white women, after the war beginning to talk about suffrage, they're beginning to talk about rights. You know, many of them have been on these farms uh, and the men have gone off to war and the white women have done very well, thank you very much. And then it's a new sense of independence. And so part of this lynching idea is to make women, uh, white women afraid and to protect them 
from themselves, right? To protect them, <laughs> really, right? And to keep them uh, suppressed. What many white reformers, unfortunately, what their counter argument was, was that because of our moral superiority, because we are not, because we are not sexualized, as Ida said we are, but because of our moral superiority, we deserve to be in the public sphere. We deserve to have the vote. We deserve to do all these other things because of our, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of our purity. So when Wells castigates that and sexualizes white women by saying, you know, a lot of this rape business are consensual liaisons between black men and white women. And if anyone's being raped, it's black women. Uh, and so when she begins to, when she turns that idea around, then whites get very, get white, a number of reformers get very, very upset with her because she's taking away their rationale. Yeah. And, 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 and they ostracize her a bit from the, from the suffrage movement, right? I mean, what, what are the consequences of that for her? Well, they're, they're, they, they certainly try to marginalize her uh, uh, and begin, and this is very familiar to all of us, some of them begin to say, well, she's a little crazy. Right? There's something sort of wrong. She doesn't know who her friends are. We're trying to, where are her friends? We're, you know, there are a number of women, of course, and you know, they talk about, we, 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 we hear the, some of this, other versions of this now. You know, their parents were part of the Underground Railroad and they helped black, they helped slaves escape and they were this and they were that and that, you know. Uh, and they had interracial, some of, them, uh, some of these organizations were interracial and we let black women in. And so it's all, so it's all, I said, she's, what's wrong with Ida Wells? You know, that she would castigate, and that she would take this line of argument. And of course it wasn't a respectable line. Well, and argument. some black men said this as well. Oh, the brothers were tough. <laughs> yeah. Including yeah. W.B. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois. Well, that's, this is a long story. With, with w. Well, unfortunately, with w. we don't have long time. No, oh, dispense he, he with, he's smart, with the boys He's smart quickly. not to get me started. No, I w. want w. you to get started. They're telling me I only got so much time. Oh, okay, yeah. So tell us, <laughs> tell us what we need to know about Mr. Du Bois. Oh, my God. <laughs> You know, David Levering Lewis, Du Bois's biographer, is a very good friend of mine. And I said, you know, Du Bois wasn't Du Bois until about 1930. He was a twerp before then. And really very conservative. But there's a story, and you can read it in the book. I won't go into it. But it's really, it's really W.E.B. Du Bois who, in the beginning, keeps Wells from being a founding member of the NAACP. He ex takes her name off the list. Because and of his relationship with the white women he's powered. Well, that's... All right, I'm putting a little part, spin on your part, history. Yeah, shut in, up. In, in part, in part. Yeah, there's a lot of contextual relation I, I do with that one <laughs> before. Uh, uh, but he was very conservative. Uh, Wells remembers in the middle of her campaign. Wells at the height of her campaign. He's still in Europe. So when he comes over, you know, Ida sort of taps him on the head and he says, okay, he's a nice little guy. Let's help, let's help him out. I think he never forgave her for that, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and he was conservative, but talk about, but he was very, talk about Mr. Respectability. Yeah. This was, this was a big issue. And so then she and, gets written. And he, he didn't like women who were too vociferous. And so then in part because of that, she gets written out of history. Yes. Um, um, and, uh, and a lot of us are still trying to remember her, but as we bring her back, um, you know, one of the things I noted, we, we get, uh, uh, our, every crop of, young interns who come into our, uh, in New York Public Radio, we get little bios of them yes. and who they, and they, one of the things they're asked is who do they look up to? And I yes. noted in a recent crop, there was like eight of them and four of them said Ida Wells. Yes. And I, so I was like, there is something changing here. Yes, something good. is happening. What is it, what do, 2018, what do, what do we need to take away from this history? What's the, what's the takeaway? Well, there's so much. Um, first of all, just her, her bra bravery and courage on an individual level. Uh, and she had just not physical courage, you know. And she's, th this is a little, she's, she's like five feet tall, uh, but carries a pistol when she needed to. Sure enough. So she had a physical courage, but the social courage to go against so many of these social norms to follow, as you mentioned, that I talked about this logic of lynching, that she just determined to take it where it was going to take 
uh, to go where it was going to take her, despite everything. And this was, she was called every name in the book. She was marginalized. Um, but uh, she was also, I think, of all the wonderful activists in this period of time particularly, in the end, I think she was the most satisfied in a way because she had done what she had to do. She had done her work, mm. and she knew that. Uh, and uh, so, but, but she paid the price for it. But she knew what she was going to pay for it. She was willing to pay it. Uh, and in the end, she was able to look at herself in the mirror and say, you know, I've done what it could be done uh, for my people. Folks, please join me in thanking the wonderful Paula Gittes for her work and for educating us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So before we move into the next part of the show, uh, Let's first, everybody, if you are listening to or subscribed to or in any way uh, listening to the United States of Anxiety, raise your hand. And you, and you can be honest, we don't need any lying to the pollsters that you're going to vote for Hillary and then you vote for Trump. Just, <laughs> and, and, and then if you are listening and you have rated us or reviewed us or told somebody, raise your other hand. All right, so we, need, we gotta have, y'all have to spread the word about this because what we're trying to do uh, with this podcast is we're just, we're trying to build a community of people who wanna talk about justice, about social justice and equity. We don't, there are no murder mysteries in the United States of anxiety. We may one day have a murder mystery, but it's, the, it's, it's, we're not chasing dead bodies. We're trying to learn about the world that we've put together at together and where we're going together. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to just continue to invite people into the conversation. So, so we hope that you will, uh, that you will tell folks uh, that we are out there and come join us. We started uh, the podcast in 2016. Uh, during the campaign, we were trying to understand, genuinely, I mean this genuinely, we were genuinely trying to understand what was going on in the minds uh, and the lives of a section of white America that, uh, uh, that was fueling the Trump movement. Feel like we got it, feel like we figured it out. Um, uh, so uh, we have moved on from that question. <laughs> and, uh, and in this season, as I said earlier, we're really trying to understand the relationship between gender and power in American politics. And we're spending as much time as we can talking to women around the country uh, in a whole host of walks of life who are pushing back. Who are, who, are, who are pushing back in the way uh, that Ida pushed back. Uh, there will be, tomorrow's episode will be all about Ida Wells. You'll hear a lot more from Paula Giddings, uh, so I hope you'll listen to that. And uh, to give you just a quick sense of the kind of stuff we're doing, I have I've just returned from Georgia last night. Um, I am exhausted, by the way. Um, so if I lose track of my thought, train of thought like that. <laughs> um, that's why. Uh, but uh, so, so I've been in Georgia. You guys, uh, I, I suspect, uh, have heard of the governor, governor's campaign in Georgia. Um, uh, so Stacey Abrams is vying to be the first black woman ever elected governor of the United States of America. Um, she is running against Brian Kemp, who is the Secretary of State of Georgia. Uh, and I think would himself say that uh, he has spent uh, a career becoming one of the most uh, aggressive and well-known policers of the voting process uh, in, uh, in the country. Um, and so this map, this is a map from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Um, uh, you can sort of see it because I just stole it off their site. Uh, but uh, this is a map of precincts that have been closed uh, in, since in the last four years Georgia has closed 214 voting precincts. Now, we, you know, in the news this past weekend has been about these 53,000 people who, uh, who, whose names, whose registrations are pending, who may have to vote uh, by, uh, by a, 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 a temporary ballot. That's just part 
of the voting story. That's, that is the easiest to wrap your head around. This is probably the biggest part of it, is these counties around here where they are closing down where you can go vote. And that has a, 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 real, a, a real impact. I, so down here in that southwest corner there um, I, is where I was hanging out this past weekend. Uh, and I met a woman named Shirley Cody. Um, and Shirley is fierce. Um, uh, Shirley is 74. Um, and she lives in Clay County, Georgia, population 3,000. Um, and um, they have, a couple years ago, they moved her polling site. Um, and uh, Shirley, you know, the, the thing about it is that she had, she had lived in Atlanta her, for much, she grew up in Clay County, moved to Atlanta, had a successful life as a nurse, and moved back to take care of her parents, and came back and said, wait a minute, what's going on in Clay County? Because when she left Clay County, it was a thriving community of black folks. It's majority black. And it was this thriving community. And when she got back, there was, it's 40% poverty. You know, and so she drove me around and she pointed out, she was like, that plot of land, we used to own that and that, all this and through here it was black owned and now it's all white owned. And that's Shirley's perspective on voting because she says, well, you know, our county commissioners, from county commissioners on up, have been white Republicans for 30 years, 60% black county. Um, and so she's been organizing that county. And so we're gonna tell, I still gotta write the story, but we're gonna, <laughs> We're going to tell Shirley's story eventually in this, in this podcast. And I show, her, I, I, I show her picture to just set up the next conversation we're going to have uh, with three women who are like Shirley uh, and like Ida uh, have been pushing for change. Um, and, uh, and, and in my mind, they kinda, each of them kind of represents a, a slice of, of, of Ida's legacy, electoral politics. Ida ran for office at one point. Um, uh, uh, speaking truth through media and organizing, organizing, organizing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring each of these remarkable women up one by one, have a question for one, and then bring in the other. We're going to talk a little bit, but then we're going to very quickly move into the group conversation stage of the evening, uh, and so y'all should be getting your questions and your thoughts ready uh, to join the conversation. Okay? Okay? okay. All right. So the first person I would like to introduce is Siley Avalinda. Siley serves as the execu executive director of NJ11 for Change. She was a founding member of the group's steering committee. Uh, she was once the vice president and assistant general counsel of a New Jersey community bank. But in May of last year, her congressman, uh, New Jersey Republican Rodney Freelingheisen, sent a letter to her employer targeting her because of her activism. You may have heard this story both in the podcast and on WNYC where uh, Nancy Solomon broke it. Um, and, um, and, and that led to the loss of her job. Uh, and ever since then, she has been uh, raising hell in, <laughs> in, in New Jersey. And so what, the question I'm gonna ask each person, and I'm gonna uh, ask you, we're gonna have plenty of time to talk about uh, the work specifically, but you know, when, you, when we talk to, to folks who get involved, people like Ida, they all have a story kind of like Ida's moment where you're at the crossroads um, and, uh, and, and, and have to decide either I'm, I'm, I'm gonna walk away or I'm gonna go all in and it's gonna cost me something. Um, and, I, and I guess I just wanna hear about that crossroads moment for you. So I feel like I had, I had two crossroads moments. Um, one was, Fairly obvious, you know, being a new, newly minted activist, it was uh, the entirety of 2015 and 2016 and watching people that you think are in politics are supposed to be doing politics the right way and I'm watching the train going off the tracks and I'm like, isn't anybody gonna fix this um, before we have an election? And then waking up, you know, the day after the election and realizing that that person was me, right? That who, if I was gonna, if we were, anybody was gonna stop it, it had to start with me. And then my second moment was actually relating to the letter. Um, when you have, when I had somebody with so much power use their title, their influence, their paper, their stationery um, to target me specifically about what I was doing, I had to make a choice about what was more important, to step back and stay in my career and be able to do things either quietly or not do them at all on the side, or to come out into the light and push push myself and say, you know what, expose that person for what they did, but also challenge myself to stand up 
very publicly. Um, and I feel like those two things for me have been that moment combined. And what, what is the, what is, for, if, for those of us who haven't gone through that, what is the emotional, what is the emotional intelligence there? Or the thought, like, how do you be like, okay, yep, I gotta go. What is, what is? So you don't know me very well, but I'm actually really stubborn and I'm, I'm not very easily intimidated. I tell people all the time, the only individual who intimidates me is my mother. That's it. Um, so despite getting a letter from my congressman or seeing a letter from my congressman um, clearly attacking me in my place of business, looking for an outcome that involved me stepping away or me losing my job, um, I was not in any way scared. I actually found the entire thing quite funny at first because, I mean, I'm a lawyer. Like, who puts things in writing? Nobody puts things in writing. You're supposed to make a call, right? Um, but, but for me, it was really about it wasn't even a question. Like, I knew I had to come out. Like, for me, it had to come out. And I took my time because I wanted it to be thoughtful. Um, I had promised my employer I would not link their name with my activism in any way, shape, or form, which is part of the problem that I was having with my employer to begin with. Um, but it was really about teaching my children what it means to stand up for yourself. And that, to me, was it. Like, I couldn't go home and say, you need to stand up for yourself, and yet, hide and pretend like this didn't happen. So we're gonna come back to this. Um, we're, the, thank you. The next remarkable person I wanna bring out is Jamila Lemieux. Jamila is a cultural critic and a writer and just, you know, and I have to say, a, a, has been around for the beginning of Spitting Fire for, from black media for uh, every time I turn around, here's, it, it, and a, <laughs> woo, it, as, of as you can see from the beginning of Twitter, uh, and, and has just been speaking so much truth. Uh, she has recently made a pivot into spit, a, a tipped her toe into electoral politics, uh, and worked on Cynthia Nixon's campaign to be governor. Uh, was the okay. communications and engagement strategist uh, for Cynthia Nixon, and Jamila. Same question to you, you know, because you are really almost on the daily saying things that people don't want to hear. Um, and it, was there a cross modes, crossroads moment for you where there was a, where, where you said, you know what, this, uh, this is, the, I need to live this kind of life. I have to move forward and speak. What was, did you have such a moment? You know, we had a little time to think about this beforehand. Um, and I really can't come up with a point in my, I really can't come up with a point in my life in which I was not outspoken in whatever space I occupied and had whatever platform was available to me. It may have just been holding my friends captive in the lunch table in high school <laughs> and making them listen to me read Bell Hooks and Malcolm X. Um, you know, to, that I have, there, there's no point where I can't recall not being cognizant on some level of inequity um, my parents were activists. My father was a Black Panther. My mother was active with a uh, student nonviolent coordinating committee. These were values that were handed down to me. Um, feminism was something that I found on my own. I'd say around the time I was 11, 12 years old, my first feminist essay was Fix Your Own Damn Dinner. And, <laughs> um, which was really interesting. I was deeply bothered by a Kraft macaroni and cheese commercial that had vocals from Gladys Knight. And I'm like, you're singing about, this is one of the most gifted voices in, on the planet, singing about the most mediocre <laughs> product imaginable, a parody of something that, you know, African Americans and people in the South take very seriously, and we're singing about it like what a gospel choir, you know, about just like this idea, but for some reason that I connected that to, so women are just supposed to do everything, huh? We have to cook, we have to work, we have, because I didn't know women, you know, regardless of their station in the world, I didn't know women who didn't work. You know, so it was like, okay, so every, every woman I know works, and most of them are doing everything, if not most of everything at home. This, this isn't right, you know? And, and so there's that, and it's funny that I was so riled up about that because my mother was a single mom, so I saw her, of course, performing everything, and my father was very active, but it wasn't that I was watching this play out between two people who would have been debating over who was washing the dishes. I was just so bothered that women had to always wash the dishes, you know? Um, but a few years prior to that, when I was very small in second grade, there was Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. 
and that was my introduction, I think, to the idea that, okay, there's racism and there's sexism. And then there's the unique ways in which they show up in the lives of black women. And hearing people, particularly black women that I admired, not many of them, but a few that stuck with me for all these years, I was eight, talk about the idea of Anita Hill taking down a good black man, you know, or taking down a powerful black man. That was devastating and confusing to me in so many ways, you know, because wasn't she black herself, right? If, if we're playing a racial loyalty game, we have someone who allegedly did something and someone who was allegedly the victim. So why are we deciding that the person who is uh, deserving of our protection is the alleged assailant? If both people are black, like, none of this makes sense to me. Um, it has not been an easy life. I was a feminist before it was cool or popular. There was no Beyonce on the stage with the onesie and, you know, <laughs> female celebrity. At least the most recent version. Right. The most recent iteration of Beyonce did not exist when I decided to be a tiny little feminist. But, you know, I, I don't think that I do anything particularly remarkable or special. Um, I've had a few jobs in media. I've got some jobs in communications now. And I use, again, any space that I step into to advocate for people who are marginalized. Let me just bring the third out. <laughs> yes, please, Jamila Lemire, y'all. Linda Sorsor is a racial justice and civil rights activist and community organizer. She is a Palestinian Muslim American born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Linda co-created the Women's March in 2017 and is a member of the Justice League NYC an organization committed to racial to criminal justice reform through direct action and policy advocacy. Linda, I, there, we could read your bio all day, to be honest. Um, and, 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 I, and I have to say, I mean, I think, you know, it f probably, at least for me, you're probably the person up here who it's hardest to imagine the crossroads because you have been so engaged for so long on so many things. But where, was there a crossroads for you? Was there a moment where you were like, okay, Now's when I got to step into this. I think I had many, many crossroads. Um, just being such a multifaceted person, you know, I'm Muslim, I'm Palestinian, I'm a daughter of immigrants, I'm from Brooklyn, which is a very important part of my identity. Um, <laughs> Brooklyn's in the house. Um, uh, but I, I think there were some moments for me where I had to make very important decisions. So obviously I've been working on many issues, including national security reform, criminal justice reform, and immigrant rights in particular, and at the intersections of those three issues. But I remember two moments recently um, in the last two years that I kind of had to make some decisions and found myself in a space. Um, one was at a large, um, one of the largest Muslim conferences in America where I gave a keynote speech, knew, knew that I was being Facebook lived and knew it was recorded. And uh, the right wing uh, pulled out a piece of my speech and actually made a video about it to the point that it got into the hands of the son of the United States, uh, the son of the president of the United States of America. And what they did was they pulled out a word that I used um, that is a very misused word. It's particularly, it's a buzzword um, that is used by the right wing, and it's the word jihad. And they said that I was calling for a holy war against the president of the United States of America. And some leaders in my community called me very concerned about my safety because it was like, like it was outrageous. I was like trending on Twitter. It was really bad. And death threats and a uh, former NYPD officer doxed me. It was really bad. And then some leaders in my community called me up and said, Linda, you know, this is scary times. Like, you may want to go out with a statement and apologize and try to clarify. And um, I sat with myself and I said, I have two choices. I come out and apologize and try to, quote, clarify what I was saying. Number two, I double down. And I, of course, I'm from Brooklyn and I'm Palestinian. <laughs> so uh, I was like, I sh yeah. So I was like, I sure in hell damning and apologize for who I am, nor will I apologize to people who despise me and my faith, and nor will I have to clarify to anyone who will not even try to understand what I'm saying. I'm going to double down and I'm going to practice my faith and preach my faith in whatever way I feel like it because I have every right to. And I went out publicly. I wrote for the Washington Post. Next thing you know, people were writing it. Interfaith leaders, scholars of Islam, religious scholars who are not Muslim came out and said and defended kind of this moment. And, I, and that was a turning point for me. I could have retreated. I could have apologized. And I was like, absolutely not. I will not cower to haters. And then my second moment was last year, people probably remember this, huge controversy that hit the governor's office. Um, I was invited to be the CUNY commencement speaker at the CUNY Graduate Center, and it went, they went wild. It was like 
you would think I was getting paid like $100,000, that I was about to get the Nobel Peace Prize, and it was really not that serious. And <laughs> my, they, it was you know, everything that you can imagine, defamation, slander, death threats, people trying to intimidate me in every which way, calling my cell phone, mailing things to my mom's house. It was really bad. And then my mom finally grabbed me in the corner. She was like, look, you speak in the er everywhere. Like, do you really, do you think it's that serious? She's like, just, that's it. Just, just say you're not going to do it. Like, j let's just get this over with. And I was like, no. I was like, I don't give a damn if I have to drag myself, if they have to figure out how to build a tunnel for me to get to that university. I'm speaking at that university because I will not be silenced and I will not be intimidated. And I did. And there were probably more NYPD officers than graduates at that school that day. <laughs> and um, I went to the school and they probably thought that I was going to get like Betsy DeVos when I got there. <laughs> And I didn't. I had a standing ovation. Um, this was a school that most of the graduates were people of color, most of them um, of immigrant background um, and black people. And it was one of the most inspirational days of my life. And it was a way for me to go back to my community and say, don't you ever cower to haters and people who will intimidate us. I have every right to speak. I have every right to have these platforms. Um, and those kind of have been my moments that I had to make a decision and overcompensate for people in my community who are, in fact, afraid um, to be as visible as I am. We're Yes, yes. We're going we're gonna to get right into bringing you guys into this, so raise your hand if you have a question for these panelists. I'm going to get uh, started, and I'm going to come down here with you so that we encourage you to do that. Um, so, but one of the things that I, I guess I want to put to all of you, um, uh, but, but, I, but Linda, coming right off of what you just said, is... Do you, what do you feel like you have lost? Because one of the things in Ida's story is that she lost stuff. Um, she really did lose things because of her choices to be brave in all the ways that, that you have. And I think a lot of us, when we make these, we, we're, we're debating we're taking these kind of brave steps that all three of you have described, we're thinking about what we're gonna lose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and some of that is real. So is that real? I mean, have you, what, what have if you lost? If it's lost, it wasn't meant to be kept or Mm -hmm. to be sustained. I mean, I've lost relationships, but ultimately, if you can't stand behind me for using my voice and being who I am and being authentic and calling out a member of Congress, then you certainly don't need to be in my circle. And you lost your job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did lose a career. Um, also, don't feel very badly about that, and I'll tell you why. Um, because I feel like, if you call it a loss, it means there's nothing there to replace it. And I feel like I have something to replace it. I have my integrity that I always had, but I stayed true to myself. I used my voice. I showed my children what it's like to stand up to a bully. And right now, I'm sitting here with a microphone talking about it, so I didn't lose anything. Mm -hmm. He did. He doesn't have a job <laughs> as of January. In case we had lost that, by the way, Rodney Feelingheising did resign rather than stand for re-election after something like, what is it, how, how many years, Nancy Twit? So, Sorry, it's yeah. the same difference. I'll let the reporters get it accurate. I'm just hosting. Uh, uh, Jamila or Linda, I mean, what, what is, it, thinking real, you know, I mean, what is, what is, what have you, have you lost and how do you process that? I mean, I, I professional opportunities uh, come to mind very quickly. Uh, you know, I was in, I was an editor at Ebony Magazine for five years and after that I was a VP of news and men's programming at a, another black digital, media, or at a black, Digital, me digital media company, and one, staying in black media deliberately meant earning less, um, not having a trajectory to certain places, um, because it didn't matter what those publications may, or, or the work that I did at them meant in the eyes of black folks. When I, if I were to go to a Hearst or a Condé Nast, I'm not coming from Hearst or Condé Nast, right? Um, and talking about things that are controversial. I watch peers that, you know, you could say we do the same things and we do them in equal skill set, but, you know, this person is a little bit safer. You know, they're not capable of offending someone or saying something provocative about race or about gender, um, and that that's kept me out of certain spaces. Relationships for certain. Uh, I'm consistently disappointed at the, no I, I mean, I've had, for all the things that trolls and people say about me on Twitter, and I was very deliberate not to tell a few stories at the beginning because I don't want to give life to people who tried so hard to take away right. from mine. Um, but the, I, I realized that even though I think of myself as this little small entity, like just a person who's a writer and who uses social media and does you know little talking head stuff here and there, 
that there are people who I'll never know who have this monster idea of me and their head is some sort of man-hating monster, you know, because I talk about gender or some sort of, you know, racist nigger, <laughs> which is what I get called on Twitter. Yeah, I love when they put those two words together. Um, <laughs> show me who the real racist is. Um, it's obviously the, the racist you nigger. Look this um, up. <laughs> you know, but there are people that think of me as that as well. I'd say less of that than there are men who look like me who think of me as some sort of vile black man hating monster because I speak out against R. Kelly and Bill Cosby. Mm -hmm. And that's been heartbreaking. You know, yeah. it's been heartbreaking even when I'm having, you know, a great conversation with someone and for them to say, wow, this is not who I expected you to be. I'm like, well, who did you think I was going to be? Like some sort of monster from a swamp, you know, that, that came out to kill black guy? Like it, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's caused me a sense, I think, of peace that I didn't realize I had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was an issue I had a few weeks ago with a particular troll, and I was sitting in a coffee shop for hours and hours, and I saw men who typically I would be like, oh, he's cute. Like, he's got on the, like, the look that I typically go for. Like, he looks like he reads, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, particularly, like, he looks like he reads, you know, Chango Bear and, like, listens to, you know, Kendrick and Diggable Planet. And that's usually, like, be still my heart. But I'm thinking, is this one of the, like, thousands of people I've had to block on Twitter for saying awful things about my family or who's right. told me that I should die? You know, um, so I, I can't imagine, you know, what the, these two ladies are doing, like the, the, the amount of, of attention that comes to them for that, because you do walk around mm -hmm. with that idea that is this one of, you know, the guy on the train, is this somebody who, who said those awful things to me? Because a real person said them. That's true. I want to get to, we have a question, but first I want, Linda, you to have a chance to answer this, because as we were saying behind, back in the green room, I was saying, I was uh, walking through the newsroom the other day, look up, which is a common experience, you can look up at Fox News, and you just see your face. <laughs> you know, you don't even know what they're talking about. Apropos of nothing, but all right, we need a news break. Let's throw Linda's face so we can scare our viewers. What? what, what <laughs> I mean, for me, I've lost a lot of things, and I think a lot of times people see folks like us, and particularly like me, and think I'm some sort of celebrity activist, like I'm enjoying this life. I actually miss my old life, my life where I was organizing on the streets of South Brooklyn with my local community, working on local campaigns. I've lost safety and security in New York City. I don't take public transportation. You'll never catch me on a bus or a train in New York City. I have lost the opportunity to go out in public spaces with my own children because I am responsible for their safety. I don't sit at coffee shops randomly. I don't just go to random places. I get in a car, I go to my location, I get back to my location. I work from home in the privacy of my own home with my door locked because I'm not safe in my own city that I was born and raised in. So I think what I hope that this, when you see a lot of these visible activists and you think, oh, here's somebody on the cover of this magazine or this magazine, that's cute and it's nice, but it's actually a very small part. I would actually rather not be on the front page of a magazine. I'd rather actually be able to take my kids out to dinner at any place of their choice and not have to worry that somebody's going to recognize that they are my children and want to harm them as a proxy to me. Um, and I think these are the things that we have to think about um, often, and it's not something that I wish upon anybody. And for me, my visibility comes with a responsibility. Because when people see me, they don't actually see Linda. They see Muslim. I represent something to people, and I'm also something that is very important to my own community. So for me, I have to overcompensate courage because my people need me to be courageous. Mm -hmm. And if I'm afraid, then what, what are my people, what are refugees, immigrants in my community that I organize with if I'm not courageous? What are they going to be? So for me, there's a lot that comes with this, and, it, and you lose the sense of who you really want to be because you have to be so much for so many other people that are around you that are counting on you. Can I just very oh, briefly add to that? Briefly, so we can get to... The, the idea of being so... What would it, you just said, that you represent something very important to your community, but then you're this idea in other people's heads. Mm -hmm. So like for femini black feminists, there's this idea that like we represent that something else in people's heads, and our community still hasn't decided that they're with us yet. Mm -hmm. And that's a particular kind of a pain to live with. Mm -hmm. and we're going to come... We're going to talk about that before we get... Please, introduce yourself and then ask your question. I'm Elaine. Um, I live here in Manhattan. And, okay. Um, I appreciate your talk and, and your comment. My question is, when you experience hate and resentment from people of color and people who are not of color, describe the difference in the kind of hate that it is. And do you think for people of color it's a different kind of hate, not necessarily outward hate, but fear, mm -hmm. as opposed for others, maybe outright hate, that the stakes are higher for someone of color in getting behind you? And to what degree do you judge them? All right. 
I mean, I think for me, um, 96% of my haters are white folks. They're white women and white men, and particularly majority of whom are white men. Um, I do have some crit critics from my own community, many of whom are conservative Muslims who see me as too progressive um, and trying to get me back in line. But in fact, that's not actually a majority. I think even the folks in my community who are conservative Muslims have come to terms with me as being still an important person, although they may not agree with me on you know, some particular issues that I care about. I do get criti critics from, quote, the movement, and particularly, again, from white liberals who really can't under come to terms with me. They want to kind of figure out, like, how, so we're liberals, we're atheists, many of whom are also, like, will uplift women like Ayan Hirsi Ali or other women who call themselves, quote, ex-Muslims, and that's what they see as progressive. Here comes a unabashed, unapologetic Muslim with a hijab, and they're just like, oh, my God, I don't know what to do with this lady. Um, I also get critiqued um, because I'm Palestinian. I, uh, I'm not pro-Palestine. I am my people. I'm pro my people. Um, so I've had a lot of um, cr critics within the, quote, Zionist or right-wing Zionist movement, and some of whom have shown up or are in the progressive movement. So I've created a lot of challenge, and I've become a mirror to the progressive movement, not just because of my views of who I am. So if if you're going to come to the movement, you got to come to terms with me because I'm not going anywhere. So that's just a little bit of it. Um, the, no, the, 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 the pro-Israel stuff is a lot of it. And that goes into the white, because there are never black Jews or black yeah. folks that are of Jewish faith. And, and of course, it's not all Jews. In fact, many of, most of the folks that I organize with, particularly the white folks who are allies in the movement, are actually Jews um, who are quite progressive and have been organizing with us. But I just get like equal opportunity. Like it's like from the right to the left, and in the middle, the center, the Hillary folks, everybody. But I think the the viciousness of it; those are more critiques of my positions and people who challenge my ideas. But the actual vicious, violent hate comes from white men in particular, and a couple of white women in particular around the Kavanaugh organizing that I was doing in the last month. I was like white male fragility, and then all of a sudden the women came out, and I was like, whoa, whoa, this is, you know, oh, the 53%, there you go. But, I see but, you. And before yeah. we, we're going to move over here, but quickly, just Jamila or Sile, speaking to this sort of, you know, the, the people you're trying to lead, are, I don't want to say lead, because I know none of y'all would say it that way, but the people that you're trying to organize and speak with and, and be in community with, sometimes being the people who don't want to hear what you have to say as well. Yeah. Um, what, is that, what is that experience like? It, it's devastating. I mean, at, at this point, I'd say, at, earlier in my career, it was primarily uh, vitriol and, and harassment from white folks because I was, uh, I guess, more readily associated with writing things or working in spaces where I was dealing with race. And I stepped into those spaces largely to talk about gender. And honestly, there's a part of me that felt, has always felt that I have a better chance at I should say this was something I thought for a very long time. The last year or so may has shifted that, but that had a better chance at getting black men um, to think differently about black women and, and to get black people in general to reconsider some of our attitudes around sexuality. Um, and I don't mean homophobia or the myth that we're more homophobic than, than other people, but just the entire spectrum of mm -hmm. spe sexual identity and life than I would trying to fight with white folks about race. Um, and there's something happening between women mm -hmm. that is giving me, pa you know, and, and there's something that's happening, I think, with some, not most, you know, not even many, hopefully, but a, a significant enough number of our men that are reacting to mm -hmm. seeing black women participate in feminism um, and, and seeing the fall of men, powerful white men, and saying, you know, if it can be him, if they can do this to him, imagine what they'll do to me. And, and clinging on to this, myth, this idea that they can access white male, white supremacist patriarchy um, mm -hmm. because they can touch part of it. And so to get, so the vast majority of the, the, the harassment and the bullying and the just awfulness that I don't even want to, you know, I want to tell it all, but I don't, that I get these days is from black men. And that's devastating because I'm not doing this just for women. I'm doing this for all of us. That's right. We're starting to get tight on time. Siley, I, I yeah, have a very I, specific thing I want to ask right, you about. Right, but I just want to, I mean, I obviously don't interact. So people don't interact with me in the same way that they interact with you. I am Hispanic, but I'm white. So when people interact with me, they see a white woman, right? So it's a very different, like all of the experiences you're describing 
are extremely different from what I see, and most of what I get are just men who know more than I do telling me all of the things they know more than I do in bullet points with sub bullet points. And this is on both sides. Um, so I obviously, I have a very different, um, I, I don't, you know, you guys have so much grace. <laughs> but one thing you are, I, I know that you are working on with that I'm gonna prompt you to talk about is that in the movement that you're building, trying to create some diversity in it. Right, well, the 11th Congressional District is notoriously not diverse. Um, and that's just a fact of the way it was gerrymandered and the way it, uh, just where we're located in New Jersey. Um, and the idea that when we started, you know, we looked around, those of us who were organizing, and said, wow, there's a, but there's still a significant portion of our population that's not represented. We may not be a very diverse um, district, but that doesn't mean these voices shouldn't be heard and they shouldn't be represented at our table and they shouldn't be part of what we take into account when we're organizing. So, you know, we have a larger, um, uh, our largest minority population is mostly Hispanic, but there is a, you know, a black population. And the idea that we have to do this intentionally as organizers, especially when we're organizing in these very white spaces with very white voices, that it's not just about, it can't be serendipitous, let's just see how many, you know, people who aren't white show up. It really has to be an outreach. So part of what we're trying to build for the, you know, the sort of the second wave of this organization is really intentional outreach to ensure that these voices have as much prominence as mine, as anybody else, because if we don't do it that way, what'll happen is it'll never progress further than white women talking about white women problems mm -hmm. in a predominantly white area, or white people talking about white people problems. And I think part of what this movement has, over two years, I think we've seen is you jump out of the gate, and you guys, you know, you've been doing this too, you, you jump out of the gate, you run out of the gate, and then you have to take a step back and see how do we make this even better, and how do we make this even more inclusive? Over here, and then we'll do over here, and we're gonna have to do speed rounds, sadly, because I didn't manage the time well. Uh, I wanna say to Jamila, right? Um, you call yourself a feminist, and um, I guess my message is that Everybody having a voice is very important and it helps a lot of us understand. Uh, I didn't have, my name is Kimberly, I didn't have um, necessarily um, any, like, I don't wanna say role models, cause that, you know, but you, uh, 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 an image of feminism, because I'm one of these black girls growing up. Feminism, white women, the issues mm. that we have, that are still going on, okay? Yeah. And so I applaud you for saying feminism and that you're a feminist. I consider myself more so a womanist, mm. okay? And I know there are plenty of us, you know, whatever we call ourselves, but um, about Anita Hill, I will say that I was in grad school during that time, and I'm sure that some of those people who projected that questioning of you and what you were doing were also feeling it's just freaking uncomfortable mm -hmm. to see this black woman and this black man and having this dirty laundry air in front of this panel of white people. Mm -hmm. It was just freaking uncomfortable as a black person. Now I know there were some people who had very strong feelings from the very beginning in a certain direction. I was one of those who I had layers of feelings. I'm gonna have to direct you towards the question. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just voicing that. You know, so that's also out there and we are still picking through those layers when it comes to sexism, racism, and all that. There's plenty of us out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, something that uh, Carol Mosley Brown said to us uh, and when we interviewed her, she was one of the Senate, we tried to talk to as many of the living women who have served in the United States Senate as possible, which is sad that it is possible to do so. But um, uh, uh, we spoke to Carol Mosley Brown and she said that what became complicated in her race when she was running, she wasn't running because of Anita Hill as she ran in 92. Mm -hmm. She was running because of Clarence Thomas mm -hmm. and Anita Hill complicated her run mm -hmm. because black men, and this is in her telling, did not want to hear yeah. about Anita Hill. Mm -hmm. um, but do you want to, quickly, do you have anything you want to add to, to I'm sorry, tell, you, tell me your name again? Kimberly. What Kimberly had to say? Yeah, I'll just say briefly uh, that that's 
an experience that I've certainly read about and heard about from talking to a number of uh, folks that were a little bit older than I was back then and, and talking to my parents, just talking to other black folks about experiences we've had throughout our time in this country. So that is Bill Cosby and R. Kelly too. Some people, the yeah, I was surprised how many people were just talking about how uncomfortable they were watching him do a perp walk. And I said, yes, but I'm so used to Bill Cosby the criminal at this point that it, it, it does not feel, <laughs> You know, it, the first time I saw him do it, you know, I felt something. But I'm like, at this point, I've seen 60 women on a magazine cover. There, there's no, all of my emotions to, for all the complicated feelings about your legacy, like there's no emotional anything that I have for this human being mm -hmm. at this point. And I wouldn't care if every single one of them were white, you mm -hmm. know, the accusers. But the fact that the black female accusers are, you know, just shuttled in like they're just, we're just so stupid that, you know, people, white folks knock us over the head and make us feminists and we'll just sign up for anything to take our men down because we have such a healthy relationship to white men and white women, right? Yeah. right? They've always really looked out for us. And so when they decided to take down black men, we were the first ones that they call. Um, but I'll say I, I, I'm happy that we're getting to a place where more of us are learning to be comfortable with that discomfort because I have a duty to protect, I think of black women first and foremost, but protecting all women, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes that means airing out really dirty laundry that implicates someone who looks like you. And, and sometimes there's, there's not a black woman in the picture at all. And that, that's painful. It's hard. But we have to advocate for ourselves. You know, it, 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 we, we have trying to, we, we must protect and, and stand with black men. And they should protect and stand with us too. But not to the detriment of the other. And seeing black men exonerated for crimes, you know, sexual crimes against women of any race will not do, it's not retribution for the loss of Emmett Till. Yeah. You know, it doesn't undo anything that has been done to us in this country. It only creates, it continues this idea that someone else can be a cisgendered heterosexual white man. Mm -hmm. We've already got those. We don't need any more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one more, got to keep it fast, uh, and then responses quickly. We'll have one more question, and then we've got to wrap up. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Odochi Ibe, and I am a writer. And I just had a question for you. I know we usually hear a lot about, with activists, whether you chose it or not, that it's like a sad, there's a sadness, like, you know, not being able to go outside with your children the way you would like, or the anxiety that you would feel from just people and men in gen general, but what are some of the positive, like the things that are keeping you moving forward? That's wonderful, because see, that helps me, because I was supposed to try to yeah. find, uh, get us back to a positive space, <laughs> and so you have done my job for me. I mean, for me, it's and just let's go the right community, down the, road. the community of people that you find, and the feeling that it's not just you standing there by yourself, that there are people standing in front of you, next to you, behind you, and always supporting you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, that to me is, is worth not having a career. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I won't say activist, but as an advocate or someone in this space, uh, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they've seen pictures and videos and stories about my daughter with the mini Mila hashtag. Mm -hmm. And she's five and a half years old and she says these really lovely things about race and gender. Like she just has such a beautiful sense of her identity and such a reverence and respect for other people's identities. And you know, once uh, she was complaining, this was like when she was super little, she was complaining that the sun was going down. And I told her the kid or it had gone down. And I said, well, the, you know, people on the other world have to, other side of the world have to have the sun, too. And she said, well, you know, I don't want to share the sun. She had a little viral video moment. I don't want to share the sun. And I said, well, he'll be back tomorrow. And she said, it's a girl. <laughs> You know, and, and yes, really a couple of days ago, she was telling me a story about somebody having a crush on someone else. And I said, well, you know, if she likes him, she said, well, how do you know it's a him? Oh, I love that. So moments like that for me makes awesome. all of it worth it. Um, for me, I think um, their activist, my activist life, which I did not choose, um, and it was uh, around kind of the horrific attacks of 9-11, which is how I got into this work. Um, two things are love. Like, lo I love my family. I love my children. I want my children to live in a, in a country, in a city that respects them and embraces them. And in order for that to happen, I have to be a part of making that happen. And the second part I'll say, and many folks know me, I come as part of a trio, um, and many folks know I organize with 
um, Tamika D. Mallory and Carmen Perez, and they are my sisters. I have joy in my friendships that I have built in this movement. This is not just a job for me. It's not I don't wake up in the morning and do a nine to five job. I have built a family in this movement that I'm from. People who are ready to not only fight for me, but more importantly, fight for me and my people when I'm not in the room and when my people are not in the room. And that gives me hope because that's the kind of place that I want to live in. It's the kind of world that I want to live in. So I have a vision. And I think a lot of times in the work that we do, people don't, people are looking at like, oh, let's win an election. Like, I don't look at 2018, 2020. I'm looking at like 2070. Like, what world are, am I creating and what am I going to be a part of? And that's what drives me because that's I'm looking 50 years ahead. I may not be around and see the fruits of my labor, just like Ida B. Wells and many um, w women and legendary women that have came before us didn't see the fruits of their labor. But I know I'm eating the fruits of their labor right now, and I hope one day somebody will eat the fruits of our labor. You know, make me cry. <laughs> Folks, please thank Linda Sorcera, Jamila Lemieux, and Sally Avalinda for being here tonight and for their fabulous work. Thank, thank you. you. Before Ida Wells died in 1931, she made a very specific request. She asked that the song, I've Done My Work, be sung at her funeral, and it was. And so, in honor of Wells and the women who have come behind her over these nearly 90 years since then, and in honor of all our guests tonight and in honor of you, we will perform that song. So please welcome Marcel Davies Lashley. She is a Brooklyn native and she has an incredible voice to sing for us. I've done my work. Uh, good evening, everyone. So what Kai didn't know before right now is that you're going to also help me sing this song. <laughs> There's gonna be a little congregation participation and I'm gonna sing a line and point to you and then you're going to respond, yes? <laughs> Yes you, can, you yes, you are. <laughs> With that misplaced joy, nervous laughter just now <laughs> from my friend here. And you can pick a part, a harmony, or you can just all sing in unison. It won't be the entire song. We don't want to traumatize Ida's memory. Okay. <laughs> yes, and take all of your own and my mistakes in love. And I am honored to be a part of this powerhouse women, and Kai is the bravest man I know <laughs> to have done this today. I've done my work, I've sung my song, I've done some good, I've done some wrong, and I shall go where I belong. So he knows my heart, he knows my heart. and every thought, and every thought. He, knows my pain. he knows my pain, and joy I brought. And by his love, and by his love I, shall be taught I shall be taught the way to him, the way to him. I know. my soul so we can blind so full of fear a mortal mind and he will lead and I shall find the way to him I 
know he guides my steps and he knows best he will not harm where he has blessed and so good night I'll take my rest, I'll take my rest, where sweet wild roses now grow. Thank you. Marcella, thank her, please. Thank her, please. Thank you so much, Marcel. Thank you so much. We're going to get out of here. We hope that you will, if you have not yet subscribed to the United States of Anxiety, we hope that you will do so. I also, one more piece of business. He thinks he's going to, if Christopher, if Christopher Johnson, if you could come here, please. Christopher Johnson stepped up and produced this night for us. Everybody, please stay calm. He's got a fierce podcast of his own called The Realness about sickle cell anemia and Prodigy's life story. If you haven't heard it, subscribe to it. It is fierce. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. Pass the word about the podcast and go vote. Right. <laughs>